A lot of weird people hang out at Coney Island. It's probably one of the reasons I enjoy going there. We've always enjoyed going there. We've taken our kids there uh, since they were really little. We go and we hang out at the aquarium and we go to the beach. There's kite flying and you go to the boardwalk and there's games and there's rides. And of course, you end with the trip to Nathan's original hot dogs. I mean, this is just what you got to do. We don't go there for like the mermaid festival or the hot dog eating contest. I think I would like gag just a little bit and so we don't, we don't do those things. But we did recently go, uh, just last week, my brother was in town with his family from California. And so we thought, hey, why don't we go to Coney Island? It'll be a fun little trip uh, for all of us. And while we were there at the beach, we got to talking about how kids seem to remember the negative parts of their childhood. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when you, when you talk to kids about like how things went and how this thing was or that thing, it's often they, they highlight or they happen to remember the things that like you, you kind of wish they, they didn't uh, remember for whatever reason. You know, you could be having a great family vacation, but what do your kids actually remember? Well, they, they remember that um, while enjoying this crazy expensive vacay in Disney and you've been waiting on a line in the middle of July, for two hours, and it's like a million degrees, they remember that you lost your temper. <laughs> Wait, but what about everything else? Like we just had a great week and there was all of this other stuff. So I asked our kids, uh, two of our kids were there with us this last week in Coney Island, and I said, hey, do you guys remember our Coney Island trips when, when you were younger? And uh, no, mostly not. Mostly they don't really remember them. and. Uh, so we were like, oh man, there was so many great memories here. And then all of a sudden we walk over to Nathan's, the one not on the boardwalk, because that's not the original. We went to the one that was the original, right? And so we walk over there and there's the outdoor seating, right? So you know all of these, the big tables that are out there, the green tables. Anyway, my son, he walks over, he says, now I remember it. And I'm like, finally, he remembers a family day and coming to Nathan's and enjoying hot dogs. He's like, yeah, we were, he sees it in his head. He's like, we were right here. We were sitting right at this table. And I'm like, this is so cool. He's like, and a homeless guy, he walked over to us and he asked for money and you refused to give it to him. <laughs> Ow. Ow. I was like, oh man, that's what we got to remember. Life's like that. The painful, hurtful stuff, it somehow sears more deeply into our psyche than all sorts of good stuff combined. And this is important for us to remember because our words and our behaviors have lasting consequences. It makes them very important, especially as followers of Jesus. The way that we live, the things that we say, it matters. And it matters for all of our relationships. It matters when we're dealing with our kids, with our coworkers. It matters in our relationship with God. How we treat people matters. And it can have long lasting consequences. Christianity is designed to change our lives for the better. When you became a follower of Christ, that's actually what you signed up for. And we're going to see one of the ways that Jesus is calling us to this kind of change. So let's open up in a Bible to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Matthew 5, 21. Now, as you're opening up there, I want to give you a little bit of theological background before we dive into our actual text. So we're in a part of the Bible called the Sermon on the Mount. It's three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the Sermon on the Mount was a series of teachings that Jesus gave to ex explain to his followers how we were going to live in this new kingdom reality that God had introduced with the coming of King Jesus and our lives as followers of his. And it starts at the beginning of chapter 5 with this whole list of blesseds the blessed life, and it's the Beatitudes, but it's, it's all about how to live the blessed life. And this is really biblical shorthand describing the holistically full life. It's that, that deep joy and happiness that humanity is capable of. In fact, it's the blessed life that we all long for in the deepest parts of our soul. Then 
the whole sermon outlines a lifestyle of obedience to the deeper ways of God's kingdom. Just a whole lot of ways to live. Lifestyle decisions that would make us holy. Now, holiness is another biblical concept that has to do with us being set apart for God and set apart from the world. This is a, a very important concept because we get set apart from the world by virtue of our virtue, the way that we live. Now, the assumption that underlies the whole sermon is that happiness and holiness are inseparable. Nowadays, especially lots of people, but especially Christians, we pursue God as a means of happiness, obtaining something from him to alleviate uh, something negative in us. And so we pray um, for God to fill, him, fill us with his presence. We pray for his joy. We pray that he would alleviate uh, the ache that we have in our souls. And in a sense, we're looking for a psychological relief from the pressures of the world. We're looking for happiness. Other Christians turn around and they say, wait, 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 that's all hogwash. God isn't interested in your happiness. He's interested in your holiness. A lot of us have heard this growing up. So they say, stop looking for happiness and start obeying God. Stop sinning, stop resisting, stop dawdling, start doing and living righteous lives because holiness equals happiness. You see, if you go after one or the other, you're going to miss out on both. But Jesus, he weds these two concepts by starting the Sermon on the Mount with the blessed life, promising it at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and filling it with the way we ought to live. He weds these two so perfectly. Holiness and happiness are inseparable according to the Bible. And the pursuit of holiness is the pursuit of happiness. And I think this is so important for us to remember. In actuality, the reverse really is, is a challenging concept too. If, if you pursue either apart from the other, you'll get neither. If you pursue false holiness without happiness, then you will actually get legalism and harshness. And if you pursue false happiness, usually through the idols of our day, then addictions and emptiness happen. And holiness isn't the result. In either case, you will get neither. But you can have both in increasing measure. Now, one final point by way of background. <clears throat> The Bible doesn't teach that we will find salvation through our good works. And this is a really important concept we have to kind of lock down in our heads. And I point this out because sometimes it's going to sound like we're saying that we're saved by being good people, especially because we have all of these ethical teachings found in the Sermon on the Mount. But nothing could be further from the truth. It simply isn't the way the scriptures explain our salvation. And I know that comes as a shock to a lot of people because most of us grow up this way. And I know that some 20 or 25% of you who are sitting here today still think that if you are a good enough person, you will get to heaven. It just isn't what the Bible teaches. And it's not what Jesus came to show us. Salvation is ours through the work of Christ and our trust in him. It is a free gift. Our behavior is a result of that free gift. Our holiness comes as a fulfillment of an experience of our salvation. It's the fullness of our salvation and is incredibly important as, a, as that concept. Now, now we are ready to jump into our text for the day and see one of the ways that Jesus wants to make a difference in our hearts. So verse 21, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, which is just an insult that means like empty head, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You have heard, he caught that phrase, right? You have heard, but I tell you. 
Six times in this section, Jesus is going to say that. You have heard, but I tell you. He's taking the Old Testament teachings. This is right out of the Ten Commandments. And he's saying, this is what you've heard. Now, he's not changing the Ten Commandments. In fact, what he's doing is he's deepening the understanding and the interpretation of it. He's saying, you've heard this, and they've only applied it to you actually killing someone unjustly. But I'm telling you, that's not what the Sermon on the Mount. He claims the authority to tell us what the Bible really says. And that's important for us to remember who Jesus claims to be in, in relationship to all of these laws and rules. They're his rules to begin with. And he's saying, here's what it actually meant. It's way more than simply not killing someone. It has to do with how you will treat them. And anger itself, he says here, is really, it's the seed of murder. All of murder is wrapped up in that tiny little seed. And if it is given the right environment to grow in your heart, that anger would grow into a murderous spree. That's what he's telling us. How many of us now can look at this and say, well, that's a massive extension of this idea of, of one of these key commandments. This is how it now directly applies to me. And that's the point that Jesus is making. Because the anger here is equivalent to calling people names. Like idiot or moron, which I have not yet done today. <laughs> it's still early. But, but you see, in God's economy... This kind of anger is worthy of judgment because it is the seed of murder. Now, we have to just quickly qualify. There's God's anger, which is always righteous. And then there is our anger, which can be righteous and even sometimes is righteous, but rarely. And then there's our unrighteous anger, which is what we're talking about. So the vast majority of anger in this world and in your life is actually what we're talking about today. There is a little bit of your own righteous anger that, that we're not talking about here this morning. We've talked about that at other times. And there's God's righteous anger, which we're not talking about either. We're talking about our unjust anger. And the commandment not to murder in the Old Testament wasn't simply about killing someone. It was about how we treat them because the positive is stated in the negative command. That's how all of these commandments work. And that means as followers of Christ, we're actu we actually have murderous tendencies in our hearts. Which brings it to a whole new level of application for us. Because if, if you've been angry like this, or you've called people names, or you've been resentful and petty, and you have killed their reputation, or you have killed their hopes and dreams, and you have, and you have murdered their image of themselves with your words and with our behavior, then, then we have done the very thing that Jesus is talking about. And we are deserving of God's wrath. Whether it be for murder, we're judged, or whether it be for unjust anger. And judgment is filthy. I mean, this little few little verses here, and judgment is hit three or four different ways, different times. It's a huge part of this passage. It even ends with that little phrase, the fire of hell which is, it's an interesting little phrase. It points to the valley of Hinnom, which is just south of Jerusalem. And it was a valley that the, the really horrific kings, ancient kings of Israel, they used to worship the false gods down in that valley, even offering up their children as sacrifices. And then it became a place where they would dump like the dead bodies that nobody would want or claim. And then they would dump all of their garbage in this valley and then they would burn it. And so the smoke from all of this disgusting part of humanity just, it, it wafted it up and it became a symbol of God's eternal judgment on sin. And that's the reference he's making here to the judgment that we receive and that we deserve when we violate God's ways. Now you might be saying, well, that's really bad news. I, I should definitely avoid anger. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to suppress my anger. But suppressing anger isn't enough. I mean, that's actually what he's talking about here. It's like saying, you know, I really want to murder someone, but I'm not going to. Okay, that's good. Yeah, don't. But that's the point here. He's saying, no, it's not about just you not doing it. It's about the seed that exists in your heart. You can't simply suppress it and think that you are free of this kind of judgment or the behavior is honoring to God. It isn't. 
because yet you suppress it, the seed of anger is still there. By the way, you can't really suppress it. You think you're suppressing it. You're not suppressing it nearly as good as you think you are. It still ble leaks out. It still bleeds. It, you know, there's many a time where we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to try to hide it. And other people are like, you ain't hiding nothing from us. You know, we totally, we totally see it. Maybe some of you are really, really good at it. But most of us, it kind of leaks out. So you can't really suppress it. But what you can do is you can displace it. You can jostle it out of your soul. How? Look at verse 23. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So how do we displace it? Well, this, this, is, a, a, this is a really interesting section because Jesus has just switched the storyline on us. At first, he was talking about our anger. Now he switched it, so he's talking about the anger that other people have toward us when we deserve it. We've screwed up, we've done something wrong, and now they're angry at us. And it's kind of an interesting thing as to why Jesus would do this. And I think maybe there's something in here where he's saying, listen, it's not just your own anger you need to worry about. You need to think about the anger that you are causing in others. This applies to them as well, and you need to be conscious and even responsible for the anger that you have caused in others. And I think he also shows us the way to displace that anger in our hearts. So he says, therefore, if you're offering your gifts. So you, you got the, the picture, right? So the scene is the temple. 2,000 years ago, let's all go back in time. We're, we're there at the temple, and we have our animal sacrifice. We're going to bring an animal up probably for a guilt offering or a sin offering, and the priest is going to kill it on our behalf. He's going to sprinkle the blood on the altar, and we're offering this gift as a way of being reconciled back to God. And we're saying, listen, that's what we want. Our sin has caused a breach in the relationship, and this animal is the way that God is prescribed that we get back into his good graces. The animal pays the price that we deserve, which is death. But then right at that moment, you're about to offer the sacrifice up, and all of a sudden, you think, huh, I forgot. I had that big rift with John. He and I have been, been arguing. We got into that political argument, and I, I took things too far, or maybe I, I insulted his cat, or you know, I wasn't the friend that he needed me to be, or whatever it was. Something happened, and now there's a rift. And right then, you remember it. During your act of worship, what does God really care about? Many of us act as if what God cares about are the outward signs of worship, but not much else. We think to ourselves, I'm a pretty good person. I go to church almost every week. I serve in our next-gen ministries, helping the young people. I give money. I help spread the gospel in the community. I know all the worship songs by heart. I recite all of the prayers. In fact, I even pray in public before my meals. I say grace so other people can see. I'm doing pretty darn good. And God is saying, hold on, before you go on with all your worship stuff, just hit the pause button here. Just hold on just a second. In fact, what I want you to do is drop everything. And I want you to rush to the person who you have offended. I want you to beeline for them. I want you to forget your acts of worship and actually go worship by being reconciled to the person that you have offended. As if he's saying that God wants us to celebrate our reconciliation with him after we have practiced our reconciliation with others. You could even say, don't waste your time trying to be reconciled to God if you are not willing to do the very things that God has told you to do. Don't come and celebrate God's love for you when you refuse to show God's love to others. Because reconciliation is what God desires. Reconciliation can displace our anger 
to spiritual discipline and the two don't do well in the same soul. We end up substituting obedience in ceremonies for obedience in behavior, rituals rather than right living. And God wants to displace our anger by seeking reconciliation. In this way, the way of reconciliation is actually how we are supposed to live in all of our lives. Look at verse 25. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court and do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Now the scene has changed a little bit, right? So we have a different kind of a conflict going on. It's still between two people, but not close relatives or friends like the passage before it. This is probably business partners or an employer-employee relationship, something like that. And Jesus assumes that in this, you screwed up. And now you owe some significant debt. So the guy calls the cops. You end up before a judge. You're found guilty. And you are thrown in the slammer. Now, in a situation like this, Jesus is saying, you need to act as quickly as you can to reconcile. And you need to make it personal. You need to make it relational. Because that's what actually matters in the kingdom of God. People and our relationships with them. That's what's going to matter. And besides, you don't know how much time you have. Judgment is coming. You need to take care of this reconciliation as quickly as you can. And if you get angry and you let your sin rule the day, it's as if you're lighting a fuse. You light that fuse and you're actually not really sure where it's going to lead. But you can rest assured it is going to blow up in your face. So you need to deal with it while it is still manageable and while you still have time. So get on it, be quick, be compassionate with humility because that's how followers of Christ deal with conflicts. No bravado and no machismo, no ego. Because what happens next might very well be out of your control. And that's what happens when we give vent to our unjust anger rather than seeking reconciliation. By the way, for those of you who are not yet Christians, this is some really good stuff. I mean, even if you're not buying the whole Jesus thing yet, so much of the Bible is filled with this sort of really insightful, practical stuff. So I'd encourage, you should just read it anyway and just, you find some great stuff like this and actually just, you could, you could apply this tomorrow at work. You could probably apply it this afternoon in your family. And the Bible has all sorts of great, really helpful stuff like that. I mean, there's so much more for those of you that want to pursue Christ and, and eternal life and all of that, but it's actually a wildly helpful uh, book as it stands. Now, there's this last little phrase, paid the last penny. You can't get out until you pay the last penny. And I'm reading that, and I think to myself, well, how is that, how is that even possible? So, like, uh, all right, so I'm going to read it just a little bit more into this text than maybe is warranted by what Jesus was trying to, to say. So, but it did remind me of another great truth in the Bible. So you're back in that day. You can't pay your debt, okay? So the judge sends you to debtor's prison until you pay the last penny. You see the problem here, right? How, how do you earn any money? It's a catch-22. You're in prison. You can't actually earn any money to pay the debt. What do you do? You're stuck unless, unless what? Unless someone pays it for you. Unless your family or a friend comes along and decides to bear the burden of your debt to make sure you can get out. It'd be the only way. And if we owe our debt to God, which is the way the scriptures paint it, and if God is the judge and the offended party, and he is rightly angry with our sin, then we're going to be thrown into debtor's prison. And we will not get out until we have paid the last penny. But of course, 
The price is simply too high. The scriptures tell us we cannot earn enough to pay our debt. So what do we need? We need our family. We need our friends. We need Jesus to pay the debt that we could not pay. No other human can pay it for you. It has to come from the very divine presence of Jesus. And this reminds us that we will never actually follow all of these commands perfectly in this life, that we are continually being transformed into them. But God's wrath, his anger, was satisfied at the cross for all of us who pursue faith and life in Christ. And Jesus wants us to deal with this murder in our hearts. He wants that seed of murder. He wants anger dealt with. And how do you do that? Well, you start by trusting that Jesus will actually pay our debt. And we have to remember when Jesus was wrongly accused, he didn't defend himself. When he was on the cross being crucified for no crime, he said, Father, forgive them. That's how he handled his confrontations. Father, forgive them. He gave up the riches of heaven to pay our debt. He didn't have to leave his offering at the temple because he was offering himself as the way that we would experience our reconciliation with God. That's why he's called the mediator. He's the one who stands between us and God and he reconciles us to God. And so if you're not a follower of, of Christ this morning, then I'd encourage you, don't delay. I mean, you don't know when you're going to stand before the judge. Why, why wait until that moment and try to make it right? It's too late. Why not make things right with God now? Admit that you're wrong, that admit your sin, admit your inability to save yourself and then turn to Jesus who wants to reconcile you with God. Trust in him, trust in his work on the cross and have eternal life. And then that reconciliation that we experience between us and God, that reconciliation is the fuel that we need to be reconciled with people in this world. If Jesus did it and if he did it for us, and why can't we do it for others? That's what he tells us. You've already received this. Now give it. So before we lash out with our words, spoken or typed, before we call someone names to disrespect them, before we murder their reputation, before we let unjust anger spread in our heart, before we light that fuse that ends up blown up in our face, let's pursue reconciliation as quickly as we can. You might ask, you know, you want to know what to do next? What, what relationship is in tatters right now? You want to know what to do this week? Where do you seethe and bubble over with insults and anger and resentment? You know, something's popping into your head right now. Maybe you're already making a list. That's great. The Spirit is revealing the very areas that you need to focus on. The very areas where you can practice reconciliation. Who's angry with you? What grudge have you decided to hold on to? And what can you do to make it right? What apologies can you offer? What olive branch? What forgiveness? needs to be granted. See, there is a reconciliation that makes a difference. And as you seek reconciliation, you will increasingly displace the anger in your hearts. That's the difference that reconciliation makes because that's the difference that Jesus makes. I'm going to ask the band to come up. They're going to lead us in a couple of songs as we prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table. But as they do that, I'm going to ask that you guys would stand as I offer up a prayer that God would make this more powerfully felt in our lives. Lord, what I'm asking is that you would meet each person here. Some of us, we carry a very heavy burden of anger and resentment. Some of it 
the people, things that people have done to us and we've just been angry and holding on to that anger and other times it's stuff that we've done and we're pointing fingers but we know that we're to blame. And Lord, it doesn't matter from which side we look at this thing. You're telling us to deal with our unjust anger. And Lord, you've given us the greatest resource. You've given us the cross. That's what we want, Father. Just encourage us in your love and in your mercy and in your forgiveness and the fact that you want us reconciled with you and with others. And I pray, Lord, if anybody is here this morning who's wondering about their next step with you, they don't know that if they have reconciliation, Lord, I pray that you would just encourage them to continue to seek you out. Talk with someone here tonight, today. Lord, so that they might come to know and to love you more fully and completely. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.